everyone. We're moving on to our final focused session of the day. And this is about wireless charging solutions. And uh, with that, I'm handing over to our last guest moderator, uh, Hilde Huckelberg, who is director at Innovation in Norway. Welcome, Hilde. Many thanks, Johanna, and good afternoon to everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, who are going to share first-hand insights um, into some of the fascinating opportunities uh, within wireless and automatic charging. Um, this subject, um, I know, should be very interesting uh, to all of us. Um, it could lead to reduced downtime for charging, potentially save space, and also increase scalability for public charging. Um, we'll begin this session with brief introductions of uh, transformative solutions and projects from Sweden, UK and Norway. Next, we'll invite you all to join our speakers for the panel discussion. Please use the chat for questions as there will be no time for Q&A uh, in between presentation. With no further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Karin Ebenhaus, CEO at Elon Road in Sweden. Welcome, Karin. I think you're on mute. I realize that, thank you. Um, and since this uh, is a um, digital uh, platform, I was saying, I always have to ask the same question. Can you see my presentation? Uh, not yet. Um, I think no. it's sharing now. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. So, sorry about the technical mischiefs, but in the meantime, I would like for you to take um, a moment and picture for yourself a future that is fossil free. And then when you can drive with infinite range and you would never have to stop to refuel or recharge again. I know this can sound like a fantasy or science fiction, but we are actually building such a system today in, in Lund in Sweden, where we're from. So my name is Karin Ebbinghaus. I'm the CEO of Elon Road, and we are what we called electricity on road. And the reason why we exist as a company is really that we want to make a climate impact. We all know that uh, CO2 emissions from road transportation has a quite high level. And in Sweden, it's in fact 30% of our total CO2 emissions. And we see that we need to do something drastically and electrification of transport could be a solution. But we need to rethink and redesign our system surrounding it. And, you know, I'm so old, so I remember uh, talking in the phone with a cord in the wall. And when I say that to my children, they go, what did you have to do that? And my ambition and our ambition is that when they tell to their children in the future, when we were small, we had to go somewhere with a cord or a cable to refuel or recharge. And their children will go, what did you have to do? Didn't you just drive with infinite range? So that is our ambition to do the same transformation for transportation as we have had for telecom the last 50 years. And we can see that transport is not decreasing. In fact, it's increasing. So we need to have a more sustainable approach for this. So we have developed a system that can actually auto charge all kinds of electrical vehicles, both while they are standing as well as driving. And it works like this. When the vehicle drives over the rail, it will send an encrypted radio signal, which will be detected by the smartness in the rail, and then if it's an authorized vehicle going through all the safety protocols, the uh, rail will unlock power distribution in very short segments of only one meter at a time. And that meter can transfer up to 150 kilowatts with 97% efficiency. As you see here, 300, but it's really if you have reaching two switching points, which you can do if you're a truck or a bus. But that meter that is powered that will transfer underneath the vehicle, regardless if you stand still or you drive 160 kilometers an hour. 
But since we know from the road side or the rail side, the uh, vehicle identity, we also know how much power or energy that vehicle has consumed. So it's easy for us um, to send a bill. So there's a payment solution embedded in the software in our rail. We can also measure and see the battery status of each individual vehicle using the system. So if there's a shortage of effect in the grid, actually we can decide which vehicle that should be prioritized. That means either vehicle that has very low state of charge can be prioritized, or if you have a higher willingness to pay, that's uh, flexible. But also, not only do we uh, provide energy embedded in this aluminium profile, which, by the way, is from Norsk Hydro, we have a lot of sensors. So every meter in real time, we can measure temperature, moist, vibration, even having radar visual identification. So we don't only charge vehicles, we make roads smart again. And of course, we need to connect to the grid about every kilometer. And even if this uh, is a wireless uh, session, we have no wires, but we do have contact. Uh, so this is our, what we call pickup, which current collectors underneath the vehicle because uh, we want to transfer high effects with so little energy loss as possible. That is really the core, what we wanted to achieve, to be as efficient as possible. So therefore we want to have, uh, you could say a lot of bang for the bucks, giving a cost efficient way to support or, or distribute energy. And here you can see in, in motion. So uh, for us, it's um, forget about range anxiety. We talk about range happiness because what you can um, create with electrical roads or a charging system like this is basically infinite range. Uh, and that entails uh, increased flexibility, but also saving time and money by not having to stand still. You can take the opportunity to charge while you're busy doing other things. And you can also reduce battery sizes. That is not only good for the economy, but even more so for the environment. And also if you're a fleet manager, I guess you want to transport people and goods rather than heavy batteries. So we think it's a win-win. Also um, taking uh, space uh, where, you, where you have it. I mean, we have extra, uh, existing infrastructure in the form of roads and we can use those making roads charging assets rather than taking up space in a city or building new uh, places for, for charging alone. So we think that electrical roads or this kind of charging infrastructure could really be efficient again. And I always get the uh, question, where is electrical roads needed? And I would argue everywhere. So in highways or in cities, it could use, be used for uh, charging um, places in taxi lines. But one obvious situation would be autonomous vehicles. If you remove the driver, you should obviously also remove the, the part with the cable. So having wireless charging for autonomous vehicles makes total sense. And we have made such uh, applications today for public transportation sector. We have made static uh, automatic parking charging for uh, DHL, but also for import environment to support their operations and have charging as an integrated part of the daily use to ensure increased uptime. And we think we are on this e-mobility journey. So electrical roads might be a bit in the future where we have more vehicles. Therefore, we start with uh, automatic stationary charging, turning into closed loop systems like ports or bus lines. And this is our production facility in Lund. We're, as, as I said, a startup, but we are uh, currently building one kilometer, which we have installed in Lund. So we think it's time to really unplug yourself and uh, be prepared for the future. And then we will uh, welcome our next speaker. Uh, Marco Ayres, uh, Managing Director, Flexible Power Systems from the UK. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. I'll just see if I can share my presentation. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, flexible power systems and our wider work, as well as then sort of focusing in on 
some of the activities that we're doing in the field of wireless charging. Um, the company itself is an electric vehicle fleet um, technology developer that we've been running since 2018. Our focus really is on sort of large commercial vehicle fleets in the retail and the logistics sector. Um, leadership team of the company is a group of people who've been involved in clean energy technology development, both in the transport sector and stationary generation. So we have sort of, I guess, quite a deep understanding of some of these issues about linking transport and power generation systems that we've been talking about today. And most of the people who work at FPS come from sort of software development, mechanical and electrical engineering and, and, and physics background because of the type of work that we do. The, the background to everything we do really is the sort of UK's net zero commitment um, that everything in the left pie chart needs to be eliminated in order to achieve um, net zero. We're most interested in transport at the moment. And then the, the subset that we focus on is commercial vehicles. So that, that's um, vans, trucks and buses, which in the UK is a bit over a third of um, road transport emissions, despite being only 12% of vehicles. The customers that we work with, that they're sort of vehicle decisions at the moment are really defined by, you know, the diagram on the left, it's basically that I buy some diesel vehicles, maybe I have some simple financing tied to the vehicles. And then all I have to do is to apply some fuel and also pay their maintenance costs. Though the transition to EV makes things quite a bit more complicated. So first of all, we need to start thinking about charging the vehicles. And that there's a whole load of innovation happening with charging technology that we've been hearing about today. Um, Defining the asset is maybe a bit more complicated as well, because it's perhaps not just the vehicle. Um, there's the possibility to separate out the vehicle's battery. Um, in some applications, it's sort of been done in buses in the UK with companies like Zenobi. And then the energy infrastructure itself is a sort of fundable asset. And so that, that perhaps provides more choices for customers in terms of what they do. Once you start providing charging infrastructure, that you then begin to touch on land use and other return on capital questions like, for example, should you use the charge points um, to try and generate more revenue opportunities, perhaps by making them available to people when you don't need them. Um, we, certainly in the UK context, there's a significant issue with power infrastructure and connections acting as a barrier to EV uptake, which then leads us into the challenge of defining the appropriate energy supply contracts. And then sort of overarching all of it is that you've kind of gone on this journey because you've made a commitment to decarbonize is about how that you verify that you're actually achieving that decarbonization. And so that we, we try and help to sort of untangle that complexity. We have three types of offers. We have a planning offer, um, which uses operational data to basically create quite large scale simulations of vehicle movements for long periods. And then that acts as a kind of virtual test environment where you can trial different infrastructure and vehicle choices to try and find the lowest costs and risk pathway to decarbonize your fleet. Um, we also get involved in deployment, um, but by that I don't mean that FPS people go and put sort of charging posts in the ground. It's more to do with when sort of specialist power electronics or controls devices are, are required. Um, so, for example, in this wireless charging project I'm going to talk about, we're involved in integrating the wireless charging equipment into the vehicles. Um, we also get involved in things like refrigeration solutions. Um, in terms of the operation side, we have a customizable back office platform. Um, where the a sort of traditional sort of smart charging solution won't quite fit a customer's needs. They may need maybe more integration with their systems. So that's something that we get involved in too. So where wireless comes in really is in terms of charger choices. So that, you know, as we kind of go around this diagram from sort of rapid chargers back to V2G, that there's an increasing opportunity for cost optimization, which is re really, I guess, what we've been hearing about as well with the revenue opportunities in the previous session. But for some operators, because of vehicle utilization, actually, the, it's sort of more about increasing speed and convenience. You know, this is why you go for higher power um, chargers in some deployments. And we think that wireless charging at least has the potential to offer sort of greater flexibility in some circumstances. And we've talked a bit about the sort of potential time savings from sort of not having to plug in and maybe making it feasible to do opportunity charging. Um, eliminating trailing cables and posts is also quite useful in some environments, maybe where that you're sort of space constrained, particularly that's an issue in construction environments, or where that you know you're looking to be able to do other things at the same time as charging the vehicle, like loading it. So some of the supermarkets we work with load from multiple sides simultaneously, um, and it's inconvenient to have trailing cables if you're doing that. 
and we talked as well a little bit about the sort of the fact that there's less driver intervention um, in the short term that's simply sort of people forgetting to plug in so if you put the vehicle in the right place it's charging i guess um, in, in the longer term it's about um, autonomous vehicles so it, we're running a project that's been funded by the office for zero emission vehicles and innovate uk um, it's got three legs to it one aspect is wireless electric vehicle charging um, so we're putting some relatively high power rapid chargers onto some vans, Vauxhall Vivaro E's. Um, so we've been taking care of that conversion that those vehicles are running in Edinburgh at the moment. Um, a second aspect to the project is an investigation of shared charging and logistics infrastructure. So the thinking is that if you're charging very rapidly and for short time periods, your utilization is probably quite low. And so there may be opportunities to increase the return on the assets. And then there's also quite a significant amount of EV fleet planning, management, and scheduling tools development. As one of the things that we found in the work we've done to date, looking at the shared charging infrastructure, is there's a challenge with people wanting to use it um, at the same time. In terms of where the project is, it's still going. It has another sort of about six months to run. Um, the, the first batch of four um, test vehicles have gone into service in Edinburgh. Um, it was slightly tricky getting them into service because the wireless charging technology we're using is CHAdeMO standard. Um, it's been designed to be used on sort of US buses. Um, and so we had to develop a CHAdeMO CCS converter to enable us to retrofit the technology. Um, you can now do that to um, any vehicle you like. Um, we've set up this proof of concept shared charging hub, which is being used by the Herit Watt Estates team and the City of Edinburgh Council, as well as doing quite a lot of work in order to sort of understand um, how that we where we should put shared charging infrastructure and then there's been a significant development of um, charging tools to enable us to dispatch these wireless charges alongside conventional chargers. In terms of the next steps for us that there's a supermarket trial which is going to happen before the end of this year in London um, and we hope to get some real insights as to the real benefits of wireless charging in a logistics environment and then that we're working on a follow-on site um, probably in Birmingham we'll be looking at sort of a significantly larger scale deployment, assuming that the rest of the project is successful. Um, and I'd say, I guess, sort of one of the major things that we're also looking to achieve in the last of part of the project is um, a cost down pathway. Um, at the moment, wireless charging, in our view, costs probably about double what rapid charging costs. And we think we need to achieve that kind of cost parity in order for the technology to be deployed across these um, fleets that we're looking at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, really interesting. Uh, lastly, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Frode Gundersen, his project manager and business development and mobility at Wireless Power and Communication, also known as WPC in Norway. Welcome, Frode. Thank you very much, Hilde. Good afternoon, dear audience. Um, uh, my name is Frode and I work in, in VPC. Over the past uh, 15 years, uh, VPC has developed uh, sophisticated software algorithms that control all incidents that may occur during wireless power transmission. Uh, the technology also includes transmission of two-way data communication through the center of a strong magnetic field that is transmitting the energy. This separates us from most of our, our competitors because the characteristics of the data channel uh, makes it possible to adjust uh, exactly what response and fine-tuned characteristics that we want out of the delivered uh, uh, power. This makes it possible, among other things, to include advanced charging uh, processes in the software and also charge the batteries directly. Uh, for the energy transfer itself, VPC uses a close to resonance uh, solution that we have optimized to a level that it's at the upper limit of what is uh, possible to achieve. So we have 96% uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, today, VPC supports uh, different industries uh, and deliver connectors and software with capacity up to 3.6 kilowatt, which easily can be coupled into series to enhance the total capacity. Uh, one example is an autonomous ferry project we have ongoing. Uh, in, in Trondheim um, that will um, uh, energize this uh, ferry.
So what is the specific challenge that uh, VPC are facing? Uh, so I will talk a little bit about micromobility and the Norway experience. Uh, data from US and Europe uh, prove that uh, micromobility has increased significantly the past few years and will continue to increase. And also social studies um, uh, suggest the importance of micromobility in, in the cities. So clearly the e-scooters divide the Norwegian public opinion and, and the last years uh, there has been big discussions in Norway on how to solve situation like uh, the, the picture that you're looking into. So one outcome of the regulation work was that uh, national authorities came with a new legislation in June 21. So uh, where local authorities then uh, had extended means on how to regulate the, the market uh, uh, locally. So there have been many uh, key discussion points and some of them is of course fleet management and control and of course the numbers of, of uh, scooters that uh, that uh, in like this uh, picture uh, kind of destroy the city environment. And you have of course accident reporting and handling zones and operational areas and, and when they can operate and, and so on. And of course the parking related to it. So today, uh, well, at least uh, until uh, a month ago, Oslo was probably the city in the world with most L-scooters per capita. Uh, one month ago, the number of scooters in Oslo was uh, uh, reduced from 26,000 uh, to, to 8,000. However, the, uh, the game is on and the operators today, they find new ways to avoid the regulation by license, uh, license agreements. So the reality is in Oslo next season will probably end up uh, a little above 2.3% uh, uh, per capita. And um, a French uh, analyze company, uh, Fluctio, they have uh, also uh, uh, found out that, for example, Stockholm has today 1.25% uh, uh, per capita. And... Um, and um, uh, other uh, big cities like Berlin, Paris, and Rome, they have 0.5%. So the question is, how uh, would you like to have it in your city where rented scooters represent perhaps 2% of, of the population? So that's why um, Mobidoc was created, and that is a spin-off of the core technology of VPC and was established to focus on mobility market and then in particular micro mobility. Um, VPC has project lead in an innovation uh, Norway supported project where the project of course consists of different partners among them local authorities where the pilots, uh, pilot has started. And the vision is to set the future sustainable standard for charging and parking of micro mobility. Uh, smart geofencing uh, and non-smart uh, parking areas have improved some of the challenges that cities are um, facing, but the question is, is it enough? So uh, VPC will, by introducing the smart infrastructure, uh, increase the sustainability and organization of, the, of this uh, particular ecosystem. So what is then Mobidoc? Firstly, we are not an uh, L-scooter cycle operator. Our aim is to work close together with operators and uh, municipalities so that they experience us as a facilitator for a tidy and better city environment uh, in terms of their L-scooter operations. So we will uh, provide then a parking and charging infrastructure beneficial for all stakeholders. So. What we basically do is that uh, we rent the uh, property of the municipalities and we also install the infrastructure on the public ground. But we are not limited only to, to, to public ground, of course. And um, uh, the municipalities, they provide incentives and, and the overall regulation that uh, not only we, but also the operators need to, to, to follow. Um, and uh, by doing so, the operators, they can reduce the cost of collecting and uh, distributing bikes on, on a daily basis when it comes to battery shortage. They can, uh, of course, engage users to circulate their scooters through uh, refunds. 
uh, and um, and uh, of course increase the life, lifetime of the battery through improved uh, charging. And um, as was pointed out earlier uh, in, in the former presentation, uh, when it comes to battery sizes and uh, the needed batteries for, for uh, have ongoing operations, all of that can be reduced. So the way we see it is it, it is sustainable. And of course, for the public, they will have a much more uh, tidy city environment, and especially for those who have certain uh, disabilities. So the technology behind it is um, is uh, simple. We have a charging adapter mounted on on the L scooter, but it's not only limited limited to an L scooter. This uh, universal adapter can also be mounted on uh, on uh, L cycles, uh, for example. Uh, many cities today have uh, what they call city bikes, and uh, and uh, we see that as an um, uh, opportunity to to also improve their operation by by having a, a standard uh, uh, charging device for uh, for uh, for a city. So the rack uh, that you see here, uh, here is a, a ground-mounted uh, version that will, of course, come in different configurations, um, like wall-mounted, com compact, or custom-made solution. It de all depends on which proje uh, project phase a business or local authorities are in. Um, and that will... Um, uh, that will influence which solution that will uh, suit them uh, the best. So the technology, it basically consists of L modules that uh, you can find on, 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 uh, on, uh, mounted on the L scooters or, or, the, or the L cycles, but uh, also on the, on the charging uh, device. And everything is uh, is uh, put up into a cloud system so that uh, we are also able to to be uh, the regulating body for uh, for the uh, local authority when it comes to to have all uh, the full setup of where the charging points are and and uh, this um, this secondary side that we mount on the scooter or the the cycle that can also um, uh, insert the same IoT unit that is placed in in every charging point. Yeah. So that was uh, what I had for my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Froden. Um, that was really interesting, and I'm seeing myself the e-scooter uh, boost in Norway a couple of weeks ago, and it was quite uh, interesting. Um, then we'll move quickly to our panel discussion. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, please use the chat to forward any questions to the, our speakers. Um, I will start off first with a question that goes to all of you. And maybe we could uh, start in the UK first. Um, I wonder the current status when it comes to deployment and testing of wireless charging solutions uh, uh, what do you see as the, um, the the biggest obstacles and and where are you most uh, kind of excited at the moment michael sure so i guess in terms of where we are at the moment is that things are at trial stage in the uk so that there's been demonstrations on buses on um sort of taxi cabs and things like that um re really what needs to happen is that we need to find a way to sort of reduce integration costs and reduce the, cost the technology itself in order to be able to move from these sort of interesting demonstrations of a few vehicles up to something meaningful in terms of deployment yeah sounds good um and uh, what about you uh Kajen? how is this in uh, in sweden in terms of your solution well, there are or, or ongoing different demonstration tests. Um, I mean, the Swedish Transport Administration are testing different technology, both both wireless uh, inductive and you could say wireless conductive charging for for buses. So I think it's a great interest to see how this can be going from pilots to to scaling up within short. Yeah, thanks. Makes sense. 
Um, uh, and then uh, on the micro mobility through the in in Norway, what do you think is is um, the most exciting part uh, that you're looking into now? And and where do you you mentioned some of the challenges, but are there there more to come as well? Well, I think uh, one of the challenges is, is of course to to uh, to to make the operators to understand that this uh, this is uh, this is a sustainable solution that uh, also will uh, reduce uh, much of their cost related to their uh, operations. Uh, but we we know for sure that many of the oper operators today they they uh, they have uh, swappable uh, solutions. And, uh, and they also think about uh, increasing the kind of operational time for their uh, their scooters so so that means bigger batteries the the vehicles are getting uh, heavier and heavier and and of course you have a lot of accidents related to that and and uh, and uh, we think that um, this solution can uh, reduce the sizes of the batteries and, and they do not have to invest in, in all the batteries needed for have a, uh, to, to have a full, uh, full um, operational. So, um, so that is uh, our uh, number one challenge uh, today. But the functionality, how it works, um, that, uh, that looks great for the time being. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, and I think yeah, all of you mentioned, um, at least Michael and, and Karin mentioned the, the need for more cost efficiency and um, what is actually needed to unlock the potential of a wireless uh, charging, um, both in terms of technology, as you, you mentioned and, and demonstrated, but also policy regulation. Uh, maybe uh, some of you mentioned uh, partly the business model as well. I don't know, uh, Michael. Do you want to start comment? Uh, sure. So that um, uh, I think the, the biggest barrier is the cost, um, and I think that that really resides in the power electronics choices that OEMs are making at the moment. That I think if we move more towards sort of industrial drive type technology, that we might be able to see some quite radical cost reductions in terms of the back end power electronics because the, the plates themselves are not massively expensive. The, then I think another barrier really is around OEM adoption that most of the luxury automakers had programs looking at wireless charging in the last sort of five to ten years uh, BMW Mercedes got sort of quite some way down that journey um, to see mass uptake of wireless charging in, in the passenger vehicle fleet I think it's essential that OEMs buy into that um, commercial vehicles maybe that there's more flexibility because actually there's already a practice of effectively customizing commercial vehicles after they leave the factory and so maybe you can leverage those supply chains yeah yeah makes sense and i do have a questions uh, from the audience uh, Karin, regarding um, the, the the cost as well um the question is um can you indicate how much per kilometer road it will cost to install your system Absolutely. and how long, how long does it take to install it in a highway so, so our solution, it costs about half a million euro per kilometer, one way. Uh, but that is for our, um, our equipment and uh, a small power uh, supply station. But the, transport, uh, the larger power station and the grid, of course, that is something that will be added to because we need to connect. So if there's no grid, of course, that will be an added on. Um, and when we have calculated, I mean, we're, I would say that we are amateurs. It's, it's basically our, the office guys and girls who walks out and have done the installment. But uh, when we calculate it, we think that we could install it uh, one kilometer per hour. So uh, we will not take too much time from uh, closing down the highways, but all the preparational work can be done uh, roadside. For, for preparing for grid connection. Yeah, uh, and uh, how does uh, the maintenance of the system work? And do you have any estimates in terms of costs as well on that yeah. So, So great question. Um, as you saw in the pictures, we, we have two versions of our rail, one that you can put on top of the asphalt, and then it's it's very easy to just remove it and replace it. Uh, and the submerged version, is it's, uh, it's constructed, so it's also quite easy. We make them in 10-meter segments, and the smartness in the rail will tell us 
when it's time to when, when it's not functioning well so we have sort of predictive maintenance in the software and then you will quite easily change one of those sections 10 meter sections and and from a battery perspective it doesn't really matter if there's a short lapse if one 10 meter section is not working then you so you have to have redundancy so you probably will build one kilometer extra just to have a sufficient range but i mean since we transfer so high effects we use it both for the drive line and charging the battery. So the idea is not for you to drive completely on an electrical road. I mean, you will probably drive half of the destination and then the rest on your battery capacity. So maintenance, it, it's a bit, we compare it to some extent to railways so of one or 2% annually per year. Yeah, sounds great. Um, and then uh, before we move on, I just um, uh, would like to encourage the audience also to please join in and, and ask questions. Um, I wanted to move to, to you, Flode, because you obviously said that um, uh, in Norway, they, they decided to remove some of the, the scooters. Um, how are you going to expand? I mean, Oslo is, is, uh, is um, in size not as big as London as uh, I'm uh, currently in. So if you were to put this in place in London, what would happen, um, you think, when you see your experience from, from Oslo? Well, uh, I think uh, if my numbers are, are, are correct, uh, uh, well, my knowledge is correct, I know that London has been quite restrictive uh, uh, until now. On, on how they are going to to um, welcome uh, this uh, this uh, transport uh, uh, system. So, um, uh, well, but of course, uh, London it's uh, it's a lot of uh, inhabitants, and and uh, and the way I see it is that uh, the the system that we are producing is is very simple to 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 install. So I think it will be a win win for every city to have. A, a uh, combination where operator and, and um, uh, operators wor works alongside companies like ours to to have a to have a kind of uh, full ecosystem where uh, where operators don't need to to have to to drive in and pick up scooters on a daily basis uh, to 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 do their operations so that everything's um, uh, managed uh, almost by themselves but of course uh, our system will not of course take away the re responsibility every operator has uh, related to to regular maintenance and and when thing uh, things happens but but i think the potential is uh, is really great and uh, and um, as you know, we, we, we are in, in, in the start phase here, but I think uh, for next year, uh, we will probably uh, have, uh, have a, a national rollout, perhaps some, some countries in Scandinavia, but, uh, but we are hoping for, uh, for um, uh, getting um, some of the markets also in, in, in Europe, that's for sure. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and um, in terms of... Um, uh, what knowledge or solution do you consider missing in your respective markets, if, if any, uh, in order to move forward with the solution that you have uh, presented today? Um, and that would be a great also um, uh, kind of uh, to share with the, the audience in, in terms if you need um, uh, some collaboration, but also there might be, be uh, cities or... or um, or others that would be interested in your solution. But um, let's start with Cardian first. Um, yes, of course, it, it it is a very complex ecosystem to get into. If, I mean, if you do a new kind of charging system as, as, as we do here, all of us, getting the OEMs uh, on board is of course uh, crucial. Um, and and their horizon are is it's so long and uh, for a startup that's really hard to work with so finding innovative cities or customers who want to try because i think it's really important that we start trying instead of waiting for solutions that will be fully certified and deployed before because we will as we said it, we are on a journey uh, electromobility journey and we need to gain as much knowledge to that we can share with each other so finding cities or customers or partners who are willing to actually do something 
with quite within a short time frame in in small scale so then we can learn for the larger scale i think that is really important uh, um, takeaway and that there are so many options there are so many alternatives so i can i can sense sometimes that decisions makers are more afraid of doing the wrong thing than trying to do the right thing so it's it's um we need uh, more brave people out there to actually uh, execute on on uh, future strategies that's great thank you uh, Claudia. um then michael from your side what, what would you like to see or what you consider missing at the time being uh, I, I think there's more validation of the use case particularly for sort of static wireless electric vehicle charging required um in the applications it's being put forward for um i think i'd like to see sort of some of the autonomous vehicle use cases demonstrated as well and and finally actually sort of how that these charging technologies can work together I, I think that that is really important because i think that you know we're not a sort of pure wireless charging technology developer that we'd sort of see this technology going in alongside all of the other types of technology so understanding how we can achieve that kind of optimum mix i think is really important yeah thank you a lot um and then through the it's actually a question from you uh, for, from the audience have you considered scaling your solutions uh, or your solution for cars as well yeah we uh, we have discussed it and and uh, uh, well um uh, VPC together with Blue Logic, they won the ONS uh, prize last year, but that was for the offshore market. And and uh, and uh, uh, to put it short, uh, they um, they have a, a, a bottom station where you have uh, uh, UAVs uh, on on um, uh, offshore, of course, and and the sizes of these they are uh, they are as big as uh, Tesla's these drones. And our technology uh, charge these and also uh, make sure that the data communication works smoothly. But we know for sure that um, um, uh, since we are uh, going for this uh, close inductive connection, there are some issues that we, we, we need to, to face. We saw earlier um, uh, today that the UK company, they had a kind of uh, pop-up system, but uh, you have uh, re kind of regular contacts then. So there, there are possibilities, but but we need, uh, we need um, uh, much more energy on the, on the um, um, modules that we are producing today in order to, to energize a, a car. But uh, the possibilities are, of course, there and uh, yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, in terms of anything missing or anything that you would like to see through the in order to to grow this uh, more quickly. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, every city that develop uh, that experience uh, problems with uh, with uh, micro mobility and also have a great uh, kind of uh, graphical pressure related to too much cars and uh, and other transportation in the city. Um, it's just to sit down and think one, one regular ca uh, car parking lot uh, will uh, give space for uh, 16 to 18 uh, L-scooters, some uh, low figure on, on, on L-bikes, of course. But uh, if they have a serious problem, then they really should consider of, of uh, putting this into system. Then I think... Um, it, it, it uh, will mean something both for the for the city, but also for those who are um, going in and out of the cities as well. So I think it can uh, reduce some of some of the pressure by putting this into a better organized, more tidy system. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I see now we are on time. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you so much, both through the Michael and Karin. And then I'll uh, give the word back to Johanna. Perfect, thank you, Hilde. And we're moving into the next two last uh, part of the program of the day. And I have to say, it's actually my, if you can say so, my favorite part of the program, these hosted network sessions where you get to deepen discussions and actually interact with other people in the conference. And in this afternoon, we have four hosted networking sessions. 
Um, and the first one, uh, first one is Benjamin Energy, who will host a discussion about how we can tackle electricity grid constraints when rolling out rapid EV charging infrastructure. And they are going to talk about a rapid off-grid EV charger that's powered by fugitive methane, which I think sounds really exciting. And then we have Fuse, I think it's pronounced, a Mir Miralis brand that also have quite similar um, headline, how do you transition a fleet of vehicles whilst minimizing the electrical upgrade costs? But this discussion is rather than focused on companies that want to transition towards a fleet of EVs uh, in the workplace or at home. And then we have Nodes, uh, who are an independent flexibility market operator, and they will host a discussion about how to actually monetize the flexibility from EV charging. And then finally, the fourth session is hosted by Ampeco, uh, who will host a discussion about the value of flexible tariffs for EV charging, what's in it for consumers, businesses, and grids. And I should also, also mention that Ampeco is a white label software as a service provider. So uh, start thinking about which session you would like to join this afternoon. And before you click somewhere, I will just guide you to how you get to these sessions. So in just a moment, not right now, you will get to click on sessions to the left in the panel. And when you do, you will see something like this view with four different sessions. And you simply click on the one you would like to join. And when you click, uh, you then you will need to click another time on a blue button that says share your audio and video. And again, the maximum number of participants in each session is 20. So make sure to be quick to join the one you would like uh, or that seems most relevant to you. And then before you, you st start, start clicking, uh, I just want to let you know that we will meet back here on the stage at 4.30 p.m. Central Eastern Time, 3.30 in the UK, um, for just some closing remarks together with the moderators and together with you in the audience. So please enjoy the networking discussions and see you in a little while.